All right, so we're going to get started with sensory garden. This is going to be all your senses. Smell, touch, taste, hearing. We're going to do them all. You'll see on this page, I printed this out from the University of Florida. Um, this one only does touch, sound, and fragrance. I've been so busy I didn't have time to type up my own and I've been lazy. Um, but this got a little bit of great information. We're going to go over a lot of plants. I'm going to give you the information about them, how they grow, what to look for, how to take care of them. That way you can be successful in planting your sensory garden. Whether it's something that you want to taste, if it's smell, feel, there's a different garden for everybody or you can have a little bit of both. So. Um, the first thing I'd like to start with is where you're going to put this sensory garden. Or maybe it's just a couple of pots in your back patio. Is it going to be sun or shade? Preferably sun. You can get a lot more options with the sun uh, having at least, I would say, four hours for a lot of these blooming plants to survive and be happy. So picking the location is, is going to be crucial. If you have shade, that's okay. We can get around some of that, and we also have flowers that will work well in the shade. So picking your, your location, you're going to find whether you need the sun or the shade plants, and, we're, and uh, it is important that you pay attention to that area when you're out here looking. We have two shade houses. Anytime you're underneath a plastic or underneath screen, those are going to be your shade plants. So if you're wandering after the seminar, that's where you're going to find those. Anything outside of those two shade houses, you're going to find that they're going to require about four hours of sunlight or more. Um, keep in mind that your sun will change in the summertime and it will rotate out. So remember that. I get a lot of people come back from up north and they go, uh, my plants disappeared or there's carcasses left and they burned up from the sun because the sun changed. Whoops. So we'll try to avoid that so you don't get frustrated and um, you know we'll have a happy garden. So the first thing we need to do when we're planting these, and this is important, the establishment process is going to be very important for you guys. Um, I don't believe we handed it out this time, but it's, we have planting instructions at the register, so if you want them when you exit, you can ask for them. Let's say we start out with a six inch pot. We want to dig the hole twice as wide. That's going to allow us room to fill in with good dirt, water. We want to make sure that we don't bury the plant too deep. If you plant it too deep, you're going to rot it out and it will die sooner or later. It's usually a slow process um, than a fast process. So once you've got your hole dug twice the size, we're going to go in there and we're going to use either mushroom compost, cow compost, or organic peat. We're going to mix it half and half with the existing soil, whatever you have dug out of that hole. That's going to help hold moisture and nutrients while you guys are watering and trying to get it established. It takes about a month. You go in there, your watering pattern, thank you, Ms. Shelby. We'll see who wins the prizes. Got to be present to, <laughs> to win. Um, so you've got your soil mixture in there, a half, half peat or, or compost. We're going to backfill. I like to put in water as I backfill with the dirt just to make sure there's no air pockets. As I'm backfilling, fill it right up to where the top of the level of the roots. If it's too deep, pop it out or start again. Once you get it nice and compact, your watering is going to be by a hose every day for the first week. Not an irrigation system every day you go in there turn the button on. That only waters about two inches of your yard, typically. Two inches doesn't get to the bottom, okay? And some of these plants drink a lot of water, so that soil must be moist. We water these things every day, so they're on a normal pattern. Now you gotta take that pattern and slowly work it away. So the second week's every other day, third week's every third day, fourth week's every fourth day. After that, 
irrigation should be enough. If not, um, if you see the plant stressing out a little bit or wilting in the afternoon, go ahead and give it a little bit of water. Make sure your watering is done first thing in the morning. Plants go to bed at night just like most of us. They will not drink at night. So if you water them at night and they're sitting wet all night, it's no different than me putting you in the bathtub and say, okay, let's see you how you're doing in the morning. Not going to be too happy. So keep your plants happy. Water them in the morning. Not at 10, 30, 11 o'clock when you get out of bed. It's got to be early enough. They want that glass of water first thing in the morning. Then you can fertilize with our Formula B. It's a slow release fertilizer. Uh, otherwise, you've got to wait about four weeks. Then you can go in and hit it with any other types of fertilizer that's needed. Formula B is Osmocote based. It's a blend that we do in-house here. It has minor elements that the Osmocote lacks. So Osmocote is like meat and potatoes. There's no carrots and the rest of the vegetables are not there. So we add those in. Um, it's a 90 day fertilizer. So every three months, every three month fertilizer is a good one to use because it typically feeds at a, a proper rate here for Florida. Anything longer than that's probably going to stress the plant out or not give it enough. If you do liquids, it's once every two weeks minimum. Season for planting these plants is typically here year round. Most people would say spring, March is the best month to get things in the ground. It's cool, but still got some warm. We're out of the frost. Um, but do people plant year round here? Yes, it's warm. If you get a frost, cover it up. You know, some of this stuff will be fine with frost. This is the other fertilizer I would recommend you use in your garden about every three months. This may affect your sensory garden for a little bit because it does have a little bit of an odor to it, but it is organic. Organic has come down way in price and it outweighs huge benefits compared to synthetics. Oh, not one just for our environment, but two for me and you if you're ingesting it, uh, three for the plant. This is 100% readily available. Synthetics are 20 to 30%. Hollytone. It, this is Hollytone. It's got an acidic. It's an acidic fertilizer. So anything that flowers is going to like the acidity, uh, and that's an every three month fertilizer. You'll find on our planting instructions we also talk about root stimulator. This will generate about 40% root growth. Uh, if you have any sick plants, you can use this as well. Um, it's once a week for a month three and a half tablespoons per gallon. Uh, give you a, a big boost. It's kind of like an insurance package. Uh, it'll help get those plants up and going much faster and easier than if you didn't use it. So that's a little, little boost if you need it. Now while we're on organics, I like to mention this guy. There's a couple good guys I like in this uh, there's a lot of good people in this uh, community here, and uh, this is one of them. Dr. Kirchner. This is an all-organic herbicide. Uh, works pretty well. It's seawater and vinegar, a high-grade vinegar. It's a little pricey because of the high-grade vinegar, but um, it is great stuff if you don't want to use Roundup. Um, and if you're in a sensory garden and you're touching and uh, rubbing on different things, you may want to be using this rather than something that's more harmful to the environment and ourselves. If you need to use an insecticide, because not everybody wants bugs on their flowers that they're going to eat or rub on, we do have spinosad soap. comes in a couple of different styles. Uh, this is a great all-around use. Uh, probably one of the ones I recommend the most. It's bacteria based, it's organic, 
Uh, it's safe for animals. They actually make a pill form for your cats and dogs now for fleas and ticks. It also does fire ants, does all kinds of insects. So Spinosad soap, great product if you need it. Again, it's organic. Anytime you spray any fertilizers or insecticides, make sure you're doing it first thing in the morning or late in the evening. Don't do it during the middle of the day or you will burn your plants. So I think we got that covered on the established. Anybody have any questions on getting them going? Is there any sticker agent in this? Yes, it's got soap. This one's Spinosad soap. It's got a sticker in it. Yes, ma'am. How safe is it for bees? You don't want to spray it on bees. You want to do it in the morning or in the evening. Once it's dry, it's safe. Um, we actually have a beehive here now. So uh, have I used harsh chemicals in the past? Yes, when I needed it but do I use them if I can help it? Nine times out of 10. Uh, I've, I've thrown stuff away so I don't have to spray because I've lived here all my life. I've fished this river all my life and I know that things have changed around here and we gotta do our part to kind of protect our environment here and kind of smarten up a little bit. So uh, I'm glad to have the bees, um, you know, and I'm happy to be a part of this nursery. So we're trying to do our best. We got a full line of organics now. Um, so, like, uh, yes. I have a question about the watering. If you're uh, planting during the, if it's raining, you never know when it's going to rain. If it's raining, yeah, you have to judge that. I mean, that's, you know, you're better off to go out there and add water than to say that little light sprinkle was enough because it might not have been. You know, if you get a heavy downpour, chances are you're not going to need the water. So you just kind of have to watch that. No chance of overwatering. There is a chance of overwatering, but you know, you're taking water away. You know, chances are, unless you're watering every day for weeks and weeks and weeks, you shouldn't be overwatering to, to a degree. Yeah. Um, all right, you guys ready to get into the plants? All right, so the first one's touch that we have on here. And you know, this, a lot of people say sensory garden. You start reading articles and it's saying, you know, for the blind or for the deaf or, it's for everybody. It's for everybody, you know? I, the kids probably enjoy this the most when I have these kids come in from different field trips because they get to touch and smell everything. And me being here as long as I have, 16 years, I've put my nose in just about everything around here. Um, the other guy likes to try stuff that he's been here the second longest other than the owners. He likes to eat stuff and I'm not gonna tell you to uh, take any advice from him because he has eaten things he probably should not have. Um, so Phil, man, where do I start? Well, let's start with this one. We'll start from the ground up. This is a great ground cover. Grows pretty quickly. Um, it's very hardy. Remember when I said there's very few plants that like the shade that flower? Here's one of them. So if you have a nice shady area, you need to cover some ground or maybe drape out of a pot. This one's called chenille. It's got a nice fuzzy flower to play with. You can run your hands down it. It's kind of cottony like. Um, blooms year round. It is a year round grower. You do have to keep it in check because it will root as it goes and create a mat. Uh, very pretty in hanging baskets. When the seminar's over, you guys can go find all these plants or come up here and play with them if you want. This one here is lamb's ear. You probably know this one more up north than you do down here if you're uh, a Florida person, but lamb's ear, I've got a grower that's been growing it for a couple years now, and these leaves, as it gets bigger, will get much, much larger. This is a shade grower, and I'm gonna tell you, it's a little tricky to get it to go over through the summer because they do not like the humidity that Florida has. 
They do not like the pouring rain in the summertime that Florida has. And it has partly to do with that velvety leaf. Now this time of year they like it because not, it's not raining every day. The cool days don't bring as much humidity. And uh, last year we had one that was probably about this tall, nice and big and round, and the ears or the leaves on them were like this. But these are very um, soft and kind of almost velvety. So it is a, a, a fun one to kind of rub on. Now when you're picking these plants to feel and touch, put a variety of different things in that area so you can kind of go and bounce around from different things. Um, like this one, for instance, that one was nice and soft. This one is a cardboard palm. You've probably seen a lot of these around town. They're very tropical, very easy to grow. They like it on the dry side. And if you feel these leaves, they get its name cardboard palm from the cardboard. They got that cardboard feeling very stiff. These will get up around four to six feet. They like the sun. Uh, they will also handle the shade as well. They're very slow growing though. So keep that in mind. This one here is a bird nest fern. Maybe uh, you need to go indoors. Maybe you don't want to go outside in the hot heat and you just want a couple little plants inside your house that you can do. Well, this would be one of them, okay? Or if you have a really nice, dense, shady area. This bird nest fern's got a nice uh, texture to it that's got a nice wrinkly leaf to it. Um, so it's kind of different. Uh, again, it can be used as a house plant or you can use it outside, but it must be in the shade. Any direct sunlight will burn this up in the summertime in a hurry. Um, these can get upwards to three feet and there's a lot of different varieties of bird nest fern. It is a slow grower and it likes it semi-moist. Keep in mind, if you're going to keep any of these plants in pots, that you make sure you let them drain and dry before you rewater. You talked about overwatering. In pots, it's very easy to overwater because we soak it down. We don't want it to go dry because one day of dryness could hurt it. Well, this, I'm going to go back to the bathtub. Let me sit you in the bathtub for a week and see how you feel. You're not going to like it. Your skin's going to want to fall off. Same thing with the plant. So when you're in pots, you can always, always add water. You can't take it away. So let them dry out in between your watering. It's important to check them in the afternoon just in case you went on the dry side in the morning. Check them in the afternoon. Don't let them go too dry for too long. That creates damage. The damage done from going too dry though is much better than going too wet. Once it's rotted and you lost your roots, you're done. If the plants just kind of went too dry, you can relief it back out, trim it back. So do you have things that detect that? We do have moisture meters, but you know what? They do fail from time to time. So I don't rely on them. Check the moisture on top, around the edge, or you can do what I do every morning and kick the bucket. If the bucket goes thud and it doesn't move, <laughs> you know that thing's wet. Now, if you have a ceramic pot or something, I don't say go kick that thing. You're going to break your foot, and I'm not responsible. Uh, let's go back to a couple more fuzzy leaves. Silver buttonwood. Probably grow this as a hedge. If you live on beachside, chances are this is in your yard because it's salt tolerant. It loves that salt air, stays nice and silvery and it's happy over there. It likes dry, sandy conditions and as much sun as you can give it. Now you will see sometimes they get kind of brown and moldy looking. And the best thing I can tell you is it's usually a lack of food or water's getting on the leaves. Uh, so keep the water off the leaves and keep them happy, keep them fed. Silver buttonwood. They can grow upwards to 20 feet.
got another nice silvery foliage. This one's going to like it in the shade. It'll also tolerate full sun during the winter months. During the summer months, though, I would suggest you maybe down to half sun uh, or pure shade. This is a ground cover called licorice. You can also use it in hanging baskets. So if you don't have enough yard and you need to go upwards, we can do that too. Uh, this is, uh, again, licorice. Comes in a lot of different uh, styles, but this particular one is a uh, ground cover or cascader. Works great in pots, breaking up the uh, sides of the pots. No, not edible, smelling like licorice. It just gets the name licorice plant. Um, so no, don't eat that. We did have a plant when I first started here years ago. They called it a cigar plant, and the guys all told me that's what they used to roll the cigars. And I sold the guy this plant, and I says, because he had a big old cigar walking around the nursery. I says, you got to check this thing out. It was bad. I haven't, I haven't seen them since. I don't believe everything that people tell you. A lot of this is all opinion or guidelines when I tell you these heights. So don't come to me next year and say, well, you said it was going to grow six feet and it got seven. There's a lot of guidelines in this business. This one here is Texas sage. Um, it's a great plant. I've seen it used on berms and sandy areas uh, where it's uh, native to uh, Texas. It grows in the ground where there's cracks in the ground. They like it on the dry side. Do not keep them too wet. Otherwise, you'll end up with a very sparse plant. But this is another one that you can kind of touch and feel. It's very soft. Um, so. Beautiful purple flower on and off all year long. They also come in a green form, so they're silver and green on these. Uh, so if you like putting uh, potted plants around the patio or something and you're not one to water as well, uh, this one's a little more forgiving. It also comes in tree form. Um, they'll get upwards about six feet here. That's Texas sage. sun. That one's going to want a lot of sun. You want another one for shade? I'll give you another one. This one goes both ways, sun or shade. This one here's got a nice ripply leaf, so you got texture to rub on. You've also got a nice flower to look at. Uh, they call this Jessica. They also call it Mexican honeysuckle. Um, also good for hummingbirds. Yep. Uh, this one will grow upwards to six foot. Most people will keep them trimmed down around three or even lower. Um, beautiful plant. It's got color on it year round. A lot of texture in the leaf. So if you got a lot of smooth leaves in that area, this would be a good one to put in there, kind of break it up. Uh, it's more eye appealing sometimes playing with different textures uh, uh, in the garden. It's sun or shade. Containers is okay, yep. Any of this stuff can really grow in pots. You just got to keep in mind, the longer it sits in that pot and the happier it is, the more root bound it's going to become. What happens when we get root bound? It wants a lot more water. And you got to make sure you keep up on feeding it because now there's no soil holding any nutrient in there for it to suck at. So that's usually the point where most people start failing in their pots and things start to decline is because they get root bound and we have a hard time adjusting to that watering pattern. I can tell you, I've got some plants, they become so root bound and in the summertime you could water them three days, three times a day and they're still not happy. You know, at that point, my shelf life on that plant is gone. Get rid of it. Or you got to go in there, trim the roots back, pack some fresh potting soil back in there, cut it back, and let it regrow back out. All right, a couple more on the touch. 
So we've got all these fuzzy leaves. How about some waxy leaves? Well, this one here is um, Clusia. It'll grow in the sun or the shade. It has denser growing habits in the uh, sun, but does just as well in the shade. Likes it dry. Um, this one here you can use as a hedge. You could use it as a tree. Uh, again, likes it on the drier side. It's also known as signature plant. You can go in there, take a pencil or a pen, put your name, leave a message, and it'll stay on the bush. You can put it by your front door and everybody can write their name in it. Clusia, C-L-U-S-S-I-A. So that's a neat one. You can Google signature plant. You'll see there's artists out there that actually engrave highly detailed uh, pictures in it. It's quite unique. Things you should probably avoid. <laughs> one of the guys says, oh, you need one of these for the touch. I says, yeah. <laughs> this will make a good billy club. <laughs> Keep in mind what you're using your garden for. Obviously, if it's for the blind, don't put that in there. <laughs> you know? Something like this would be a little more appropriate. Okay, it's, it is a little kind of different texture for most people. It's a little more spiky when you touch it. It kind of sometimes will either irritate your skin or if you have rough hands like myself, it just kind of feels rough. Um, touching these different things, if you have your eyes closed and you're enjoying and relaxing or maybe you had a cocktail, uh, you know, these different feelings as you're touching them, those different senses, you may want to touch this after all that nice softness or do this one first and then you touch that soft and go, ah. Oh. This is another neat one you can, the juniper family's huge. You can go from trees to bushes to anything unique. Um, this one here, this is a foxtail fern. They're kind of a clumping fern. You can do uh, sun or shade on these. They typically get around two feet at the most, kind of bushy. Uh, they're a darker green in the shade than if you put them out in the sun. But talk about a tough plant. This one here, if you tend to go away for a week at a time, this one probably is still gonna be there uh, if you don't water it. It holds a lot of moisture. This thing probably weighs 25 pounds right now. Um, half the plants would be half the weight of that. You can. Dividing plants, you always run your risk of doing some damage, but uh, a lot of them that sucker off like that, yeah, no, no, no problem. Um, All right, we did the cardboard palm. This one's kind of fun. This is straw flower. This one can go in two different departments in your sensory garden. Just by shaking it, you can hear it sounds like straw. You touch it, it feels like straw. It's very papery. Uh, this is called straw flower. Used as an annual here. Typically, you only get them to grow through the uh, springtime you get into the heat of summer they don't look as good can you summer them over sure you'd have to baby it probably in the shade but this one likes the sun uh, and does like it on the drier side um, straw straw flower comes in all different colors um, we've got a ton of them right now but uh, great potted plant or even in the ground as an annual just some extra color but uh, that's a fun one. <coughs> That's all smell. All right.
I'm going to go over sound next because this one's going to be pretty quick and simple. And then we get into the smell and we're going to go crazy. <laughs> so it doesn't always necessarily have to be plants. Um, whether it's a wind chime, this one I just happened to bring the bamboo one because we've sold down a lot on our Corinthian bells. All we got are the big ones, they're heavy and I wasn't lugging that thing out here. But uh, you can throw some chimes in there just to make some extra music. Uh, some people don't care for them. There's a few different things that you can get sound out of the garden. It's going to be harder with plants than it is with added mechanisms like the wind chimes. Maybe you want a water feature, you know, you've got your bench that you're sitting underneath a nice pergola for a little bit of shade. You want to hear that water splashing. We have simple do-it-yourself pump kits inside the store where you can just take a regular pot. It comes with everything you need. It'll plug the hole. It's got a light in it and you can bubble out or trickle into a pot. Works really nicely for making noise. Otherwise, you could purchase a fountain or anything like that. Um, another way to uh, get sound is attract some of the wildlife, you know, put up a bird feeder uh, or provide plants that may bring in the birds. I've got one right now, he comes every year, I'm pretty sure it's the same bird because I swear he mocks me every morning, you know, and he's sitting there beeping at me and everything else while I'm trying to get ready. Well, I enjoy them the days I get to have my cup of coffee. Other than that, it's... You're going to ask me that. I'm not a bird specialist, but... I don't know. He's in a tree. I can't see him. I go to bed. I go to work at night, and I, I, I come home at night. Uh, I'm guessing it's a mockingbird. I don't know. He likes Simpson stoppers. Uh, do you know what bird eats that one? Me neither. But they, that thing, I mean, he's just nonstop. He gets in that tree every morning, and I got the neighbor next door. He's going crazy. He took his tree down and everything. So this one, this one here, I just put it down. This is beauty berry. Produces very bright purple berries up on a big stalk, and they are brilliant purple. They're very pretty. Tracks the birds. Uh, this plant is a native, gets up to six foot, likes the sun. Uh, you could also plant Simpson Stopper. I have two of those in my yard, uh, kind of as a specimen, and they come in there and gobble up the berries and then go back up into my oak tree and squawk at me. So, you know, you can attract them that way to make some noise. You can get tall grasses like this one, maybe swaying back in the wind. If you have a nice windy area, you can hear it kind of rustling around. I'm going to tell you a story about this one. I wish I had a big projector and I could put it on here for you, but there are a few plants that make noise. Bamboo is one of the fastest growing plants out there. They say you can sit out there at night and listen to that thing creak and crack as it grows up. And you literally are hearing it grow. During the day, you can hear it clanking back and forth, the leaves wrestling back and forth, and it provides its own mulch. I really don't carry bamboo anymore, but if you're interested in bamboo, uh, there's a couple good local people here that grow it. Uh, if not, you can special request it, but I am going to tell you it is expensive, and I only special order it occasionally. Um, it's like surgery for the growers, so it, it's, it's not cheap anymore like it used to be. This plant here, mm, probably 14, 13 years ago, I get, I get this call on the radio while I'm up there watering in the morning. You got to get back here. You got to get back here. I said, what's going on? He says, you got to get back here. We used to have a kid named Brandon, and he watered the back greenhouse, and it was summertime. And he sprayed this down nice and wet like he's told to do every morning. And it started shooting seeds out like popcorn. 
and you could hear it just click, 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 and they're shooting everywhere. And I have it on my phone. I've videotaped it. So every summer, the guys are out here when the heat's just right. They go and water it down and cool it off, and bang, 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 they're shooting everywhere. And they come out with force. So if you feel like you got stung by a bee and you're watering your plants, it might have been this thing. So keep in mind it will spread, obviously, if the seeds are flying everywhere. It's not terribly invasive, but you'll get little seedlings here and there. This is Cressandra. There's a lot of different varieties of it. It does like the shade here. It will tolerate sun in the winter months, not in the summer months so much. Uh, upwards to three feet, and there are other varieties out there as well. This has also got good texture on the leaf, and it is waxy. There's probably other ideas out there to get sound in the uh, in the garden. They probably have rain rain gauges or chains and different things that may make different sounds. But those are the ones I got for you today. Now, I almost forgot this one. I'm being very gentle and easy with it because I don't want it to do it right away, but this is mimosa plant. They have several different breeds. This is the ground cover. And this one, I mean, the kids just, they love it. This one here, being the ground cover or a cascader, it likes full sun. It'll probably grow in the shade just as well. It's very hardy and it does grow fast. Gets a little lavender flower, looks like a puff ball from Dr. Seuss. When you touch this, now you look, it, pay attention to the texture of the plant. You got it? Can everybody see it? Those leaves are pretty much wide open. They close right up. So that's something you can see and feel. Not like the mimosa tree. Can it be invasive? Oh yes, because it crawls and creeps everywhere. But you can keep it in check with a weed whacker. Um, I don't know. I don't know. I don't. Well, actually, this one might be the native. I would have to double check. I don't know if it's more. I, I want to say it's this variety, but a lot of times we um, we get hybridized varieties. So they're not uh, as invasive or intrusive, you know, like our Gallardia. You know, everybody wants the native one, but until they get it and actually have it in their yard, sometimes they regret it, you know. So the growers have manipulated these things that way. All right. Smell. So fragrance. You guys want to start with the stinky stuff or the good smelling stuff? <laughs> Stinky, all right. All right. This one here, <laughs> the landscapers, if you have this in your yard and your landscaper cuts this thing first thing in the morning, he's the, you're the one that he's crying to me about, okay? Because it smells like wet dog and he's got to smell like that all day, okay? This is Viburnum suspensum. They also have viburnum odor Uh It's got an odor to it. Some people like it, most people don't. So when you're trimming this or smelling it in the morning, mm, if you've had enough of that sweet fragrance and you, you, know, you need that smell, or you just can't stand your neighbor over there on the side yard in the morning drinking his coffee, peeking through your shadow box fence, you put these there. Make sure he's not here today. <laughs> this one here is wax myrtle. This one uh, is a native here. It has a lot of different uses for it. Um, old farmer told me if you uh, plant this, it actually repels uh, 
flees and ticks. And when you break it up, it's got kind of a, I don't know, citrusy kind of flavor. It's different. So this one, I mean, you guys can come up here and smell all this stuff later, but this is a great bush. Also, the wildlife likes it. Obviously, if it's a native, uh, they're familiar with it. It's a good bush for the birds to hide out in, hang out. Um, but wax myrtle, you can grow it as a hedge. You can do a multi-branch tree. Uh, there's a lot of different uses you can do. They will grow upwards 15 feet plus. It puts off a flower, but it's really not significant. You're not going to see it or notice it half the time. Sun. If you put it in the shade, it's going to get stretched out, a little leggy. All right, let me see if I can find anything else that doesn't smell good. I don't have too many of those. Ah, we'll go with this one. This one's Society Garlic. So if you like that garlic smell and want something kind of pretty in there, this produces a purple flower. Likes, again, the uh, four hours of sunlight at least. It will multiply, but kind of stays in a clump. Um, and it does smell like garlic, especially in the morning or at night is when it's really going to put off its odors. Uh, I love weeding and cleaning them because it drives my wife nuts for a day or two because she, where's that smell coming from? It doesn't wash off the hands very easy. I really, I think that might have been the only two different kinds. Oh, here we go. It's hiding. It's all right. That's a tough one. This one here. Any of you guys got problems with cats in the neighborhood? Or maybe you don't want your sensory garden smelling like cat pee because you got a neighborhood cat that likes to come by? This is Swedish ivy. Cats do not like the smell of this, so it will repel them. Um, you can come up here and rub on it. It does have an odor. Some people really like it. Some people hate it. It depends on the person. Uh, it's got kind of a different type of leaf, too, so you can feel the texture on it. It's kind of stiff, um, but does have a little, little texture to play with. Um, and you will pick up definitely an odor on this. This is used for a ground cover or a hanging basket uh, or even a trailer down the side of your pot. This one likes mainly shade, can take some sun, morning sun, a little bit of afternoon sun, but preferably not all day. Swedish ivy, also known as candle plant. Lantana, this is another one that has a different odor to it. You can, there's a lot of different varieties, so you can get them as far as the ground cover as well up to a bush or a tree. There are native varieties of this plant as well. Um, but if you, again, you come up, wrestle the leaves a little bit, there's different ones with different textures. Some of them kind of feel a little bit of fuzziness or velvety. Um, but again, this one's got a little bit of a different odor to it. I can't tell you what it smells like. I can only tell you what it reminds me of is uh, pickle loaf, the sandwich meat. And you probably think I'm nuts when you come up here and smell this. <laughs> but lantana, great, ver great plant for the sun uh, and comes in a lot of different styles. So good one to play with. Uh, if you're buying the ground cover varieties, you want the very small leaf. If you want more of a bush, look for the big leaves. That's the difference in them. Oh, they bring a lot of pollinators. That's a butterfly favorite there. Bees, lantana. I'm sorry? Sun? Oh yes, yes, at least four hours. So we got a few herbs here. Obviously, rosemary, great smell, uh, very easy to grow. You can grow it in a little bit of shade, but really likes as much sun as you can give it, uh, and we'll take it on the drier side. Uh, 
This is usually the last thing standing in our vegetable garden in the summer after we've given up and haven't had time to care for it. That one's still there crawling all over the place. There is a ton of different varieties. You can get it barbecue flavored. Uh, you can get upright. You can get the ones that crawl on the ground. There's just, there's endless on this one. And it is one that's appreciated in the sensory garden a lot. Did I show you guys this one yet? No, no. Oh man, I didn't trick you at all, huh? I'll tell you a quick story. We're almost an hour in, so. I had this sitting up in my herb bench, and I couldn't understand why it was up there. And all the guys said, hey, yeah, it's the Cuban oregano. I says, no, it's not. So the owner comes up, and he, yes, it is. That's that stuff that they grow over in, uh, and I says, okay, try it. So he broke off a leaf. Started making this face, and I says, it's not Cuban oregano, is it? No. So you got Cuban oregano. This one has a multi-use. Smell is great. Uh, flavor is great. Uh, very, very hardy ground cover. Um, very nice velvety leaf on it too. So it also works as far as the touch as well. Um, preferably full sun on it. We'll take some shade as well. Strictly ground cover. You could have it cascade down the pot if you want. Um, so that's an another great ground cover. You've got mint. This comes in all different forms. Uh, one of my uh, relatives, he grows this as a ground cover in his rose garden. And it's only so he can drink mojitos, I think, every day of the week. but. Uh, very easy, just be careful, can be a little aggressive, so if you're not out there to maintain it, you might want to keep this to a pot. Drinks a ton of water, and it comes in a ton of different varieties now. Spearmint, peppermint, mojito mint, lemon mint, you name it, it's out there. Chocolate mint. This one here, how many of you say it's dill? Yeah, I, I gotta start doing this backwards. It's fennel. And the way you can tell if you're out there buying your herbs, crack a piece off, wrinkle a little bit up. I don't care if you do it. You gotta do it to figure out what it is sometimes because they got a million seeds sometimes or it's so young, you can't tell. Break it up, smell it. You like licorice? No, okay. Well, then don't smell this one. because <laughs> Fennel smells like licorice, all right? It's a sure sign to tell you right there. Oh yeah. Yeah, we had it in our pickles one year. They were good. I think somebody had a hard time IDing their plants that night. No, it lives year round. You can, I mean, the grower that grows these, he's got some that are just, I mean, they got trunks, big bulbs on them. I mean, they're huge. So it's, you can keep them going. Basil, a lot of different varieties of basil out there. I'm gonna tell you the one that everybody prefers to make pesto out of. It's hard to grow here. There's a lot of disease issues with it. Um, you know, it's just the way of the times. Uh, new diseases, stronger strands. Um, it's just one of those deals. I'm, I'm not gonna tell you that every one of you is gonna be successful growing basil. However, there's a lot of different varieties like this one uh, that are easy to grow, similar smells. Some of them smell completely different. Uh, we get one that grows the fennel. He only does it a couple times a year and he calls it rose basil. When you water that thing in the morning, it smells like bubble gum. It is so wonderful. Uh, this one does not smell quite like bubble gum. That'll bring in a bunch of pollinators as well, so you'll get that sound of the bees humming in and out. Um, if you want to get into the sweet smells, 
Next, let's do these real quick and then we'll get into the real sweet stuff. You got citronella. Any of you like that citronella smell? We've got citronella plants. Bonnie's plants were in here this morning unexpected and brought a bunch of these. Uh, so if you like to repel mosquitoes, we got a deadly combo up here that you can do. Uh, obviously citronella, scented geranium, they use that in some of your citronella oils, believe it or not. This one is lemongrass. And if you actually look on that citronella oil that you buy, a majority of it's really lemongrass. So if you're trying to repel mosquitoes in your sensory garden, or you like the smell of uh, fresh lemon, break you off a leaf, you can put it in your tea, you can chew on it, you can smell it. A lot of different uses for the lemongrass, also swaying back and forth when it gets some dry leaves in it, it's gonna make some noise. Um, the lemongrass will get upwards four or five feet. The citronella is more of a three foot. Lemongrass likes a lot of water, it grows really fast. Your citronella likes it dry. A lot of times they have crop failure with that plant when they start them from young little babies because they stay too wet and rot off. We're going to get into the jasmine. There's a, several different varieties of jasmine that bloom that smell nice. Night blooming is one of them, so if you're that night owl that likes to sit out back and enjoy the evenings, night blooming jasmine's a good one. Works great for providing a little privacy. Can grow upwards six, eight feet if you let it. Most people will maintain it between the three and five foot mark. Very fragrant at night when it blooms. It does like to get chewed up a little bit by caterpillars though, or worms. Uh, moth comes in at night with that nice fragrance, comes in, lays its eggs, and off it goes. And then you see the damage later. The worms are hiding in the soil when you're out there looking at it, and you're wondering what's eating it. It's worms. Use your spinosad soap. This is the other jasmine that smells. This is Confederate jasmine. It's best grown in the sun, at least four hours for a good heavy production of bloom, but will tolerate some shade as well. Very fast growing. Blooms in the spring and in the fall pretty heavy. A little sporadic through the summertime. Uh, great fragrance. You can come on them and smell them. Uh, you can drive by some developments that got it grown over the uh, walls and it is uh, just prolific. If you're allergic to latex, it's not a plant for you. It contains high amount of latex so if you touch it, you break it and it starts sapping that white milky sap and you get it on you, it's going to burn your skin. So if you're allergic to latex, now you know what to look out for. Any plant that has white milky sap. There is another variety of jasmine out there that's really fragrant. They no longer carry it anymore due to the fact of greening in the citrus industry, but it's called orange jasmine, mock jasmine. Uh, there's a lot of different names for it. Lakeview jasmine. So some of you, if you have older homes, probably have some of that in your yard. If you don't, sorry, wish you did, because it's a wonderful plant. This one's a new rose we're carrying this year. We're gonna have about, oh, a big, a whole bunch of them for customer appreciation. So if you like roses, the grower is saying this has been a really easy one for them to grow. It's an off-breed from the Knockout called Belinda's series. Highly, highly fragrant. Um, supposed to be an easy growing rose, we'll see. But uh, wonderful scent. I would keep this away from the touching part of your garden. It's a, it's a Belinda series. Mm -hmm. We've got lavender, if you guys like lavender. Uh, this one I like breaking off the leaves and putting it in my underwear drawer or sock drawer. Uh, no, I don't do that. Uh, but it's got a great smell. There's a lot of different varieties out there. This one is the um, 
Panada variety. It's more of a compact variety, puts off a lot of purple flower. We've got some other varieties out there that don't do as much flowering, but still have a great smell, different texture leaf, different color leaf. You'll find these in our greenhouse. They do really well in the shade, especially in the summer months. You can have them out in the sun during the cooler months, but remember, come summertime, that's going to be one that's going to start crying out in the full sun. It's like one of some of my employees when summer comes. Another fragrant one is Bud Leia, great for butterflies if you want to bring in some of that uh, butterfly attractor. Uh, wonderful scent on it. It's a very light scent, so if you, you know, gardenia's too much for you, the jasmine's too much, this is a very soft smell. Um, of course, mine are all out of bloom right now, and I ordered some more, and they are quite haven't come into bloom, so that's all you get. But they come in uh, a big variety of sizes, colors. Right now, all we got is the full growing size that's going to get upwards six, eight feet, no problem. It's all right as long as it's up there. If you hear something wrestling back here and big, get ready to get on your chair. We'll have a 500 pound pig out back that became a pet when it was about five pounds and it came from here and squeezed its way through the fence. All right, this one, you know, I think is gonna catch on a lot around this place. It's been one I haven't been able to find for years uh, up until recently. And there's several different flavors of this one, but this is what they call a gardenia Tahitian. Okay, it comes in a double and a regular. You'll see in our inventory, the doubles have a different texture leaf, much darker, happier looking plant. The other ones do just as well. They're not quite as dark green. The flower is a little smaller. We also have tree form of these. They are highly salt tolerant. So if you're on the river or beach, this is the only gardenia you're probably gonna be able to grow because the other ones are not salt tolerant. Tahitian gardenia, and it can grow in the ground or in a pot. Very fragrant, blooms year round. They'll grow upwards of six, eight feet. Now you go back to another type of gardenia. This is what they call a non-grafted gardenia. You will notice there's multiple branches going down into the soil. This can only grow in a pot and these prefer more shade than sun. Will they handle full sun? Yes. They're only gonna get about three, four feet. That's where you should probably keep them. Any taller than that, they kinda get stretched out. Um, great scent, but it's gotta stay in a pot. If you wanna plant gardenia in the ground other than the Tahitian, you must request grafted. It'll have a single trunk coming up and then it'll bush out. Don't worry about the single trunk. You can hide that eventually as you trim on it and it gets fuller and the trunk disappears. This one here is Esperanza. Again, another one that's very lightly scented, so you gotta get your nose in there. And when you go to put your nose in there, we do the eye test. There's no bees. <laughs> this is, this is very, it, it, this smell to me is very heavenly. It, it is very sweet. Uh, you'll have to smell it. You, you're smiling at me. You're like, yeah, <laughs> yeah. You get to try it. Esperanza. It can be a tree or a bush. Comes in a lot of varieties, so make sure you do the test and smell it before you buy it, because some have no fragrance at all. This one's the old-fashioned Esperanza. Uh, Tacoma Stands is another name for it. Uh, Yellow Elder is another name. There's a lot of different names for it, but Esperanza is what most of your uh, guys will know it here as. Um, 
butterfly plant as well, hummingbird. Um, do not eat the green beans on there, they are not edible. Tree flowers on and off throughout the year. You can get some species of these trees that do not bloom all the time. So when you're buying them, make sure you ask. Chances are if they're in a small pot like this and they're blooming, they're ready to go. That's the variety we carry as a year-round one. Um, but you should always ask if you're not shopping here because there are some varieties that only bloom once a year. Okay. Uh, let's see. I brought a few other flowers out here. I mean, taste is another sense that we have. Obviously, we all eat food here today. We all pretty much know our spices at this point in time. However, let's say you want to wow your girlfriend, fiance, boyfriend, whatever, your special guest that just came in that you haven't seen in 20 years, and you got this nice filet mignon or whatever, barbecue ribs, whatever you want, and you want to dress the plate up with some flowers, you would not believe how many different flowers you can eat. Now I'm going to tell you, don't eat any of my flowers today. Take them home, wait a long time, make sure they're not sprayed from the grower with insecticides and you're not poisoning yourself. So, hibiscus flower, edible. Portulaca. You can put this stuff in salads too. But this flower is also edible and it comes in a lot of different varieties. Unfortunately, they're not really opening up a whole lot out here because of the shade. They need sun. Great ground cover flower year round. Like it on the dry side. Works well in pots too as cascaders. Begonias. Some of you probably have begonias. This flower is edible. I came into work one day and I was forced to eat these things. It is very interesting. The flower petals itself really don't taste much of anything other than maybe like a kind of lettucey, watery. The center, however, that orange part is very citrus, acidic tasting, and it is quite unusual. Uh, I actually ate a couple of them after that. It was different, you know, I had to really get the, and I got my landscapers eating them all the time now. It is like, you're complaining about rabbits, it might be a landscaper eating them, yeah? You know? <laughs> Out there with his ranch dressing, pouring it on there. It's no wonder why the rabbits eat these things. They actually really are quite tasty. So if you want to mess with your friends and do things like that. The other thing I didn't bring out here was orchids. Those are edible, you can put them on your plate. Um, they take too long to grow, yeah. <laughs> Why would you wanna waste a pretty flower like that? I know it, uh, but you can do it. Um, so um, there's also, I guess I didn't bring it up here. There's sweet almond as you walk in and out of here, all those white flowers that are lined up, wonderful smell, very, very sweet. It's not an edible flower, but very sweet smelling. Great for pollinators. Um, if you are a butterfly person, got a garden, you're trying to attract that Atala butterfly. My uh, aunt has lots of Kunti palms and quite a few of those and friends with them. And it is a favorite of the Atala butterfly, one of the rarest butterflies we have around right now. Um, so. Very cool one. There's a lot more different fragrant plants, things that you can try, you know, around the yard. Just make sure you're educated before you do it. Don't just go around and start trying random flowers, but this one here, if you're a good Florida native, you've probably done this once or twice, but this is an Exora flower. And what we do is we pick it off, we pull that little center piece out, and then we suck it on the back side of the leaf uh, flower and it is very sugary and sweet. Um, so if you like that little quick sweet taste while you're walking by going to grab a tomato or something, this is uh, 
this is a good one. You know, you can pull nectar out of it and you can see why butterflies and hummingbirds and different species like to suck the nectar out of flowers. Um, you know, unfortunately I didn't have any nasturtiums here today, but that's a very peppery flower. So if you like a little spiciness, you can cook with them, use them. They're quite pretty. Um, we carry the seeds. Milkweed. No, that's, that's great. Uh, he says, well, what about milkweed? Butterflies, definitely. Monarch butterflies. If you want the caterpillars, and we'll be doing a, a butterfly seminar, or you can stop at the butterfly booth next Saturday. We're going back to latex. I said that jasmine had latex in it. Milkweed has latex as well, so be careful again what kind of garden you're building. Not everybody wants to be in a sticky, sappy mess. But if you're trying to attract that butterfly and actually see the life cycle of the caterpillar and everything, milkweed is a good one to have. Um, pretty easy to grow. Uh, gets leggy, trim it back, fills out really nicely. Um, and we've got plenty of it in stock. I ordered 200 because I went through 100 last week and I had people with uh, starving caterpillars. So I don't want to do that again. Um, but. It's great, great plant. I mean, if you have dill, fennel, and parsley in there, you're also gonna get another species of butterfly. So you're getting good activity into your sensory garden that way. And um, you know, it, it, it's, that's what that's for, you know. Uh, enjoy, enjoy mother nature, you know. Uh, they just found a bee over in uh, somewhere, I think it was Africa or some one of the largest bee species they thought was extinct. And that thing is huge. I mean, incredible. But, uh, you know, those are survivors. Those are the stories we want to hear, not the, the ones that uh, we killed off and can't get back, you know. Is there any questions I can answer for you guys? How do you get a gardenia to bloom? What? <laughs> How do you get a gardenia to bloom? Pain in the neck thing. You scream and yell at it, curse at it. If that doesn't work, then, uh, you know, uh, pray and say nice things to it. <laughs> um, no, I mean, gardenias, you got to watch for your insects. So there are treatments for insects. You ask any of the guys, they'll help you with that. As far as flowering goes, the biggest thing is acidity, acid acidity. You are on limestone. Your pH is high in your soil nine times out of 10, unless you're underneath this oak tree. Uh, if your pH is too high, it can't bring in the nutrients properly and it's not going to flower properly. So try and use your holly tone. If you need to lower the pH even more, you can use dustable wettable sulfur, aluminum sulfate. You can take a cup of white distilled vinegar to a gallon of water, pour it in around the roots. Use coffee grounds, mulch with pine fines. So there's a lot of ways to get that acidity, but holly tone, if you got flowers, use it every three months. It's going to help flower. Gardenias, the grafted ones, typically only flower twice a year, spring and fall. What causes the gardenia to get yellow leaves? Ten percent of yellow leaves on a gardenia is normal. Any more than that could be a deficiency in iron due to a lockup in your pH because it's too high. Um, that's usually what it is. What is that flower on the back? This one here, yeah. Exora. This is a Maui Exora. Like the sun, grow four to six foot tall. There's other species of this as well. We could carry Super King, uh, Dwarf Exora. So they come in all different sizes, colors. Uh, so if you want a guy that only grows two, three feet, get the dwarf variety. Um, I didn't do this one, but this one would be more of a sight. This is yesterday, today, and tomorrow. Today it's dark purple. Tomorrow it'll be light lavender. And then the last day, it'll be pure white. Huh. Yesterday, today, and tomorrow. Yeah. Sun, semi-shade. It, it grows big. We got some 15 gallons like this. Uh, it is beautiful, especially once you got it in the ground. In pots, it's hard to keep them happy. They just root so fast. Um, I don't have any of these for sale just yet. Um, they're not quite ready, but that is Tibachina grandiflora. 
Um, it's a dark purple flower, rather large flower. Um, there's a lot of different species of that one. I didn't bring another one, I don't think. But we have another smaller leaf variety that's got a fuzzy leaf and then there's some slick leaf ones. They also grow in tree form. These I've got probably 40 of them in the works. And when they're available, if you guys want them, you can leave your name and number up front. Um, that one came from my grandmother's yard. I grew them all from cuttings. In the, just, sorry. She just passed away a couple of days ago, so. But that's, uh, so you started from her yard and you can't find them. My growers, I just can't come up with them, so. I grew them trying to provide them for, for this seminar and I just wasn't fast enough. Um, so probably here in the next four weeks, they probably will be ready. Um, but, so leave your name and number if you want some. They'll, uh, like I say, it'll be about a month. They bloom on and off throughout the year. Uh, they're a little bit slower during the winter months. Uh, you got to be careful when they're small because if you're weed whacking and you're shooting rocks up, they go through the leaf very easily. You'll find a little couple little holes in there from when I was weed whacking the other day. But um, very easy to grow, like dry soils. Um, you can start them yourself from cuttings. Why I can't find them from the growers anymore, I don't know. They used to be a very popular easy growing plant. I always go in there and cut them down. They're usually about six, eight feet before I cut them down and I'll cut them down to about a foot tall. Um, then take all my cuttings from there. Big, large purple flower. I wish I had brought the tree or the other bush out. I had it in the golf cart and I think probably the guys put it away, but it's a large purple flower about like that. Comes off a big purple flower spike. Um, very pretty. Tibachina grandiflora. Yep, it's a big variety. You'll find that's a huge, huge family. We've got them from dwarf. They only get about three feet all the way up to this one, or even trees that grow up to about 25 feet. They typically like half sun, half shade. Um, one of these is growing in full sun. The other one's growing in pretty much all day shade, and they're both just as happy. Dry soil. Well, you guys don't miss, you guys don't miss nothing, do you? All right. Then I'm going to do questions. We'll get you guys out of here. Some, some of these guys got to go, so. Uh, firecracker fern. It's kind of a soft one, uh, easy going. I got these in my butterfly garden. Good for hummingbirds as well, but mainly butterflies. This one will grow upwards four to five feet tall. Nice and bushy. When it gets too big, Cut it about three inches off the ground and come back like a brand new baby. Sun, sun, sun. Uh, at least four hours of sun, mine are half day. Yep, they get the morning sun, that's it. That comes in a yellow variety as well. Red's definitely the hardiest of them. But I see you don't carry it. Neem oil, I carry it. It's organic, but you gotta be careful with oil-based products. They are more apt to burn and hurt things than non-organic. That fuzzy leaf tibachina, if you spray neem oil on it, you can kiss every leaf goodbye on it because it's not going to be happy. It's got to be a waxy leaf to use oil. So that's why I recommend the spinosad soap. Very, very invasive and very effective. All right, let's do the raffle, and if you guys got questions, come up and see me.